and welcome along guys I uh, hope you liked that uh, new introduction there um, and it came uh, all thanks to the guys over at uh, Deegan Media so thanks very much to Deegan Media they went out there and uh, they got that footage there with the use of their drone um, so there was somebody made the suggestion there to me before that, uh, that the clock in the background of uh, of the show is at the wrong time it's not showing 420 well guess what now it is <laughs> so thanks very much to, to the guys at Deegan Media who went out there with the drone and uh, captured this uh, footage for me um, brilliant stuff lads uh, it's amazing now it's always 420 in the background <laughs> for the entire show <laughs> Um, so guys, uh, welcome along to another episode of uh, 420 News, brought to you by Martin's World. I'm your host, Martin Condon. And guys, if you'd like the, the help, uh, the, the, if you'd like to support the show and if you'd like to help the efforts for cannabis legalisation in Ireland, um, you can do so by signing up to the Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash Martin's World. And uh, you can also make donations in the form of Bitcoin through martinsworld.ie. Um, all of the funds that are going to be gathered there will be used to, to set up and run a cannabis activist hub in Cork City here in Ireland. Um, so, guys, if you want to show, so, show your support, uh, do go out there and uh, sign up or make a donation. Um, coming up in January, I will be uh, establishing that hub and uh, and just uh, setting the way forward there for the cannabis community. Hopefully around all of Ireland, uh, we'll see this repeated in uh, all of the different counties um, so on with the show we go guys um, I'm going to start today's show with some positive news for once And and it's uh, coming from um, the, the, There was a post that I came across this morning um, So this is where I found the news And it was uh, from Vera Thumi And uh, Vera was uh, alluding to the fact that there was a, a press uh, release there From the Department of Health um, Regarding the, the continuation of the delivery of the medication of, uh, of cannabis for the patients So Vera says here Press release from the Department of Health states uh, Stephen Donnelly will announce that temporary delivery of medical cannabis medication Will be made permanent tomorrow No practical details yet which we need uh, to find out But we have it, yes So it certainly is a celebration there That the, the, the patients here in Ireland are going to see that medication delivered uh, to the patients so I'm going to just flick on over there so you can actually see what this uh, press release looks like and uh, I'll just quickly flick on through it for you so it says here Minister for Health Simon Harris uh, which is completely wrong actually uh, wait now this is the ah this is an old press release actually apologies there guys um, so here is the current press release um, that was my bad so, Minister for Health uh, to assist patients with access to the prescribed medical cannabis products. The Minister for Health, Stephen Donnelly, uh, that's the correct one, <laughs> has today announced that patients who are prescribed medical cannabis products will no longer need to travel to the Netherlands to collect their medication. Um, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, patients or their family members travelled to the Netherlands to collect their medical cannabis prescriptions. Authorities in the Netherlands have forbidden the commercial export of cannabis oils, but will allow the filling of individual prescriptions from the EU states. Oh. A delivery service from the Netherlands to Ireland to assist patients of licensed uh, clinicians in obtaining their prescribed cannabis products was established in April 2020 and that was the announcement that I actually had opened there uh, by mistake first from Simon Harris. Um, this was on a temporary basis due to the COVID-19 restrictions uh, around travel and uh, this will now be made permanent. So speaking today, Minister Donnelly said, Many patients and their families have shared stories uh, both with me and officials in my department about how this initiative has made a huge improvement to their lives. They spoke about the stress of having to travel regularly and the associated health risks that are uh, with that, as well as their concerns that they would run out of the, their medication. I am so pleased that these problems will now be a thing of the past for them. There will no longer be a need for them to travel abroad in order to collect their prescribed cannabis products. Instead, they can focus on the health and well-being. The welfare of patients and their families comes first, and I am happy to reassure them that they will no longer have personally have to personally source their prescriptions. And it goes on to say officials in the Department of Health will finalise the arrangements in uh, respect of how the collection and delivery service will work on a permanent basis into the future. So it seems there like that they're they're just trying to say something just to, to quell the, the unrest that has been building around this issue because Vera uh, has been very uh, doing very well there uh, in the, the recent past that uh, raising people's awareness as to the, the plight that they're, they're going through. 
So I think what Minister Harris would have, or not Minister Harris, uh, Minister Donnelly would have preferred to say here is that many patients have been bothering me over the last couple of months in the continuation of the delivery. So in order to just to get them to stop annoying me, I'm, I'm now going to do the, the easy thing, which I could have done months and months ago, but I'm only doing now because they've annoyed the shit out of me for the last couple of months. Um, and, and I'm now going to put pen to paper, which I, I'm getting paid an absorbent amount, amount of money um, to do. You know, and uh, that's what he probably would have actually wanted to say, you know, that the stress and the bother the patients have been causing him. He, he's finally going to do something about it, you know. But instead, uh, he comes out with his own BS hair spin that he, he's actually helping people and that he's a compassionate person. My goal, if he was a compassionate person, the day he got into office, he would have made it his priority to do something about this. Going from his 2017 uh, statement, he is well, well aware of medical cannabis and it's a... Uh, and its value to the patients out there, patients like Ava and um, Vera's daughter and, and the many other patients out there. So, guys, while, while this is a small victory and it's definitely worth a, a quick hurrah, you know, um, it is a celebration to be had. But it's it's one that we shouldn't spend too much time celebrating because let's not let's not forget. Chronic pain is still not included in the list of conditions there that patients can get prescribed medical cannabis for. They're still discriminating against these patients and the way in which they're, they're carrying out. Why can't this be prescribed by an Irish pharmacist? Why does it still have to be delivered from, from Holland? What, what's going on here? Why, why these double standards? Why can, uh, say, a patient with chronic pain go down and get a prescription for, as Alicia Maher, uh, the, the patient stuck in Alicante, said, she can get a, a a prescription for 900 opiate-based pills filled a month, but she can't get that same prescription for medical cannabis uh, filled in Ireland. Uh, she has to do so through through the, uh, the Netherlands. Absolutely ridiculous, and it's it's not less than discrimination now at this stage. Uh, that this needs to end. And uh, Minister uh, Donnelly, uh, Minister uh, Frank Feehan, uh, Minister uh, Helen McEntee, our, our Justice uh, Minister, um, because you, you need to get your act together seriously. That the the patients, the suffering you're causing, you know, so not, not even the patients. Okay, you know, the, the prohibition of cannabis is the main thing that's actually. Um, caused all of this suffering in the first place. You know, the prohibition of cannabis prevented it from being researched effectively in the first place, which led to people like Vera having to go march from bloody Cork to Dublin, at an over 300 mile trip or, or however long it is there from Cork to Dublin. Do you know, she took that on foot to raise awareness about the, the need for the access to the medicinal cannabis for her daughter. And she only had to do that because of the feckin' prohibition that was there from, do you know, somebody like me, like, even though I could actually look back on it now and say possibly my use of cannabis at the time was some form of self-medication. Um, but, like, okay, I was 15, 16 at the time, got access to it, so I would fall into this kind of recreational use, as you would call it, or non-medicinal use. Um, prohibition didn't stop me from getting access to it. No, it didn't. I was a young kid. I could still get access to it. But these patients fucking couldn't, like, absolutely ridiculous ridiculous that that this prohibition is still continuing to this day that, and we've people like uh, Donnelly who, who again as I say he's commented on the past as that the whole prohibition it gets in the way of patients accessing it and he even went on further and saying that he, he has no objection to a person who grows this plant and he doesn't see why they should be criminalized why in the name of God have you taken up a position and for the minister for health and you've done nothing about it Zero zilch. You won't, the only thing that's come from you is this this bloody hell or this uh, press release there recently on on medicinal cannabis, uh, and also the fact that you're going to meet with Vera there in the coming days. I think you're you're due to meet maybe Thursday or Friday, and uh, you know that that's all he's done, and he's only done it because we've bothered him so fucking much, like. As I say, if he uh, if he really cared about this day one in office, I am Minister Donnelly, and I'm going to sort this shit out. Like, that's what he should have said. But no, he didn't. He, he's just a corrupt, bloody gangster politician up there, only for his own career. And uh, we, we can't support these guys, you know, guys. Uh, as I said, this is a small victory. It's a step forward in the right direction. But Minister Donnelly is no friend of the cannabis community. No friend at all. Uh, so I'll I'll drive on, guys, um, because I'll get very annoyed about this one. Um, other news coming from Ireland, guys. We have another patient here. So this, this lady here, uh, by the name of Joan Leonard, uh, was caught with €2,000 of cannabis. And uh, she was in court there recently. And um, she was in court uh, with this. And basically, while in court, she said that she used the, the, med the, the cannabis for medicinal reasons. Now, I, I'm not too sure why. 
But at some point, she made an admission that she supplied cannabis. Like, and I'm not too sure what form that admission took. What was it that she was forced into admitting it by being scared through fear and intimidation from maybe her solicitor and maybe from the guards in that, like, oh, you're caught with so much cannabis, uh, it's probably in your own interest there. Look, just plead guilty there to the, the sale and supply and we'll go easy on you. That, that is one likely scenario that could happen where Joan was coerced into admitting that, that she had the cannabis for sale and supply. Another re- one could have been just through no fault of her own in, in a Garda interview. She could have said that, like, um, yeah, I had this cannabis there and I, I, I made it into oil or, or maybe whatever it was form that she consumed it in. But she might have admitted that she also shared it with maybe a friend who who suffered with the same condition or a different condition, which cannabis benefited them also in. Um, that, that could be another reason why she got done for sale and supply. Because um, she made an admission that, that she sold it, uh, that, that, that it was for sale and supply. But at the same time, she had it for the, for a chronic pain with an arthritis sufferer. Um, so I, I'm not too sure what, what the actual situation was there. But I'd love to talk to you, Joan, if, if you happen to be out there, guys. If anybody knows Joan and if she wants to come forward, share her story. I know her case goes back up into court there in uh, February. Um, but, you know, if you want to come on, Joan, and share your story, uh, I'm, I'm more than happy to have you on anyway. The article here says an arthritis sufferer who claims uh, that she used cannabis to treat her pain has been remanded on bail pending sentence after being caught with more than €2,000 worth of the drug in her home in Dublin. Um, Joan Leonard, 54, from her address here, pleaded guilty at Dublin District Court to Misuse of Drugs Act charges for having cannabis for her own use and possessing it with intent to supply. Uh, Garda Ser- Sergeant Zita Wood told the court that uh, Garda obtained a search warrant and went to Leonard's house. Uh, the cannabis was found upstairs in the house and she made admissions following an arrest. Um, Garda Sergeant Wood told the court Leonard uh, maintained she bought the cannabis for €800 Euro and that it was for her personal use. However, the supply had a street value of €2,216, Euro, the court was uh, told. Uh, the woman had no prior criminal convictions. Pleading for leniency, defence counsel John Griffin said his client suffered from arthritis, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and neuralgia. It was, an, in, it was her intention to use it to ease the pain. Uh, he said a doctor's letter on our medical issues was available. He said adding to the case uh, might be substantial for a start of justice report. Um, this can lead to a first-time offender being spared a criminal record. Garda Sergeant Woods asked the court to note the accused had also pleaded guilty to intent to supply. Judge Theresa Kelly refused to ask for the restorative justice approach and adjourned the case until a date in February for a pre-sentence probation report to be furnished to the court. So what an absolute waste of time here. Like, and it's all because of you, Minister Donnelly and Helen McEntee and all of the other gobshites we had in government before you who, who've refused to budge on this issue. You corrupt gobshites, like seriously. Prohibition has caused so much bloody suffering that, that we have patients here who've been forced to go to the black market to get it because cause you, you, I don't know what the hell is going on up there. Like, But seriously, you've no compassion at all that you would you would let patients be criminalised like this. You know, only Friday a week ago there, uh, I shared a video uh, of an interview of, of a guy who shared his story on, on the, the Jerry or on the live line uh, radio show there. Um, go check that out if you haven't. Like, But he, he, he was another patient who grew cannabis for his pain and the cops came and raided it he had one feckin' plant and that plant would have gave him a year's worth of medication just to treat his chronic pain that year's worth of medication that, that can- uh, cannabis butter w- would have seen him not using countless uh, opiate tablets over that same period reducing his burden on the state if he has a medical can- uh, card because he could have got all those uh, pills f- uh, the prescription filled with, th- with the card but still we see the chronic pain sufferers are discriminated against because they're excluded in the list of conditions that that medical cannabis may get access for despite the fact that overwhelmingly the majority of people who use cannabis for medicinal reasons use it for the chronic pain associated with countless bloody conditions jesus christ like these the health minister, like, come on, do something, justice minister, end this bloody prohibition, like, come on, like, guys, you're corrupt as corrupt can be to, to keep the stuff bloody going. Scumbags, the lot of you. Ah, oh, um, so on, onwards we go, guys, um, because there are, it's just very infuriating to, to be covering these stories and uh, to, to see 
did this just stupidity there like that like oh we're celebrating the, the delivery of the medication but why isn't it being produced here why why like board and Mona were talking about it over a year ago but nothing has been done to date why in the name of god has nothing been done what the hell is going on out there why do i still have to go to court for fucking cannabis possession why does this woman have to go to court for cannabis possession it is not in the public's interest to be criminalizing us any longer for the possession of cannabis if we legalize and regulate it that's the best thing we could do in the public's interest you know that the prohibition of cannabis is not in the public's interest it causes so much bloody harm dangers and risks Gardy, come on stop enforcing these stupid bloody policies i know you can do it guys i know you can it's in your own um it's in your own interest to do so unless you're one of these Gardy who like to use these easy targets of of cannabis and drug possessors and your way of climbing up the bloody ranks because going out there finding the burglars the rapists the, the child pedophiles you know all of these guys that's a much tougher job for you to do and, and harder to get the results they're therefore making the progression up through your career harder so is it that you just want to continue picking the low-hanging fruit the, the guys who actually aren't danger in our society Jesus Christ, like, sorry guys uh, for taking the name of our Lord our God in vain. Um, I don't see it as a sin because uh, I don't subscribe to that stuff, but <laughs> this is just my frustration. It just really is my frustration. So onwards we go, guys. Um, this here is some beautiful looking cannabis that was seized recently by the police in the UK. And it was intercepted, interestingly, while it was going to be making a journey from, uh, from a place in... Um, in the UK called uh, Chatham and it was uh, being destined to go to Cambodia. Quite a bloody journey for it to go in fairness. Like have a look here on a map. Like cannabis being sent from the UK to, to Cambodia. That is some serious journey for cannabis to be taken. Um, fair play to him. Like uh, I don't know what the intention was there sending this much cannabis across. Was he supplying, I don't know, an, an expat or, or what? What was the crack there? Because I'd imagine it's much easier to produce in Cambodia, much cheaper to produce over there too. So I don't understand what the story was. Uh, but this this uh, seizure here has led to the, the, the arrest of a 61-year-old man. And, and unfortunately so... Um, just trying to find the article here. So, um, ba -da -da -ba 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 -bum. give me a second. Jeez, did I not save the article? <laughs> so he was a sixty-one-year-old man anyway, and he was caught with the cannabis. Where was it? Um, darn, I never saved his bloody article in here, did I? I, I must not have. Silly me. Yeah, no, I didn't uh, include it in there, unfortunately. Um, but th th as the story goes, the, the cannabis was uh, disguised as uh, tea, and it was intercepted by a courier company. And uh, upon investigations, a 61-year-old man was arrested, and uh, he's now going to be brought to court. So that that's basically the, the short and tall of it anyway. Um, so onwards we go. Um, I just thought that was very interesting. A very lengthy journey for cannabis to be making. And going the, the way in which I thought it would have been Cambodia to the UK to be honest. But UK to Cambodia. Um, just interesting one to report there. And uh, it shows the potential there for export uh, of cannabis around the world. <laughs> if we were to just feckin' legalise it and end it once and for all. So other news guys also staying within the UK. And this uh, picture here comes from a cannabis grower's shed. And uh, this was growing in um, Suttonwood Road in Specke, in, near York in the UK. Um, so this cannabis was found along with uh, a small quantity of, uh, of cocaine as well. So a garden shed was found crammed full of cocaine, which it wasn't really crammed full of cocaine. In fairness, there was two small little bags of cocaine that they, they have here in the pictures and uh, and cannabis during a police swoop last night. So this was Sunday night. The outbuilding was found in the, the uh, to be hiding drugs when police carried out a raid on Sunday night. Officers had received information from a rat that suggested drugs and cash were being kept at the address in Suttonwood. And around 10 p.m., the police busted down the door. You know, boom, boom. Jeez, well done, cops. Like, like coming in, busting down the door of a fucking cannabis grower. Like, leave the man alone. Ah, oh, ye scumbags. Police found cannabis plants and cocaine in a shed. A uh, search was carried out and officers rumbled the large, large drug stash uh, concealed within a shed. 
Like, why, why they're always trying to big it up. Like, uh, it's not that large. Look at it. It's about, like, what, 10 or 12 plants or something? Okay, 21 plants, actually, it says here. During the search, around 21 cannabis plants were located in the shed, as well as four large sealed bags of cannabis with a large amount of white powder suspected to be cocaine. Police found cannabis plants and cocaine in the shed, and the man was taken to custody where he spent the night, and he remains there at this time. So unfortunately, like, you know, this this man, you know, who knows, if cannabis was to be legalised, he could be working there and uh, contributing in a positive way to society. He could be paying taxes, employing people, but no, he's now spending time behind bars. Ah, stupid, like, you know, it's just straight up discrimination. It's it's ridiculous because we've people out there now who are taking part in the legal cannabis industry and they're making bloody millions at it. I mean, while people are just continuously being discriminated against, we're not allowed to partake in it, you know, you're, you may jump through bloody hoops. Why did a government get the right to tell you you can't grow a bloody plant? Who, who made them boss of this, like, really, like, when I was born, nobody asked me, like, you know, and, like, it's, it's our human thing to use drugs. And and there was no kind of agreement there when I was being born, you know, that I was going to can, can, you know, agree to these rules and regulations set by the government. I have no problems following the rules and not hurting people, not stealing from people, you know, not doing wrong to other people. Do you know, are, are the rules that are there within business, do you know, to, to protect businesses and to in, ensure competition and, and all of that a kind of uh, fairness and all of that stuff. But I see no sense these fucking cannabis laws, like, and the drug laws. It's ridiculous. The only sense I see in it is that it's a, it's a tool there for the authorities to basically to, to discriminate against certain segments of our society. Do you know? Like when you go to court, it's, it's, no, it's no secret that there's a certain type of people keep repairing inside there. Like, it's not the suit-wearing, kind of well-to-do, um, kind of high-earning, working-class people, you know? Um, it's not them, you know, it's it's a lot of the time, it's people on social welfare, it's people on bloody low earning students even, like, uh, these are the kind of people who get brought to court, like, it's just discrimination, it's wrong, and it's got to end, and I hope it ends soon. So, there you go, more waste of time by police in the UK, and uh, just adding to the mess that is cannabis prohibition around the feckin' world. And we go onwards, guys. We head on over to Mexico, where I'm sad to report uh, that uh, after the interview there, and if you haven't seen the interview with Pepe Rivera, it was episode 12 of uh, of the podcast. Pepe Rivera there was alluding to the fact that the Mexican lawmakers, they were going to kick this can down the road. He said they'd done it before and they're going to do it again. And uh, yeah, staying true to that, they did. They're now kicking the can down the road again. And uh, cannabis legalization in, in Mexico is probably not going to see... Um, the light of day until April 2021 again. So that's absolutely ridiculous. They're going to prolong the suffering over there of all these people again. Just for what? I don't understand it. It didn't take them this long to bloody put the laws in place in the first place. Why in the name of God has it taken so long to end the bloody stupid thing? In the, in the, you know? Oh, I just don't understand it at all. So Mexican lawmakers want another marijuana uh, legalization deadline delay. It's like, really, you know, the, <laughs> you wonder what's, what are they actually doing here? Why are they kicking the can down the road? What What is it that they're waiting for? I, I just don't understand. So it, it's coming here from a, a bill to, to legalize marijuana in Mexico. It's set to be delayed again. Although the Senate approved the cannabis legalization last month, legal in, leaders in the Chamber of Deputies agreed on Wednesday to request another deadline extension from the nation's Supreme Court. In late 2018, the Supreme Court deemed the prohibition on personal use and cultivation of cannabis unconstitutional and told lawmakers to formally end the criminalisation by t- October 2019. It's now December 2020, guys, and they're looking to kick it down the road again to April 2021. How do they get away with this lie? The deadline has since been moved back to the, uh, by the lawmakers uh, uh, request several times, most recently to December 15th, which is tomorrow, but that's now going to be moved again. So now legislative leaders are asking the Supreme Court again to give them until February to get the cannabis bill across the finish line. So it's saying here February, but from what I'm hearing on the, on the street in Mexico, they're saying, look, even with February being announced, they're going to kick it down the road again until April. Um, so just just wait and we, we will see what happens. Hopefully, look, uh, it might happen in February, but we'll see. Um, the Senate approved the legislation which would establish the regulated cannabis market, allowing eight adults 18 and older to purchase and possess up to 28 grams of marijuana and cultivate up to six plants for personal use in November. And these are the issues that Pepe Rivera said that, that, that they don't, they're not good. 
why is it only six plants? What's the story there? That's discrimination. Why can't I grow seven plants? Why am I a criminal if I grow seven plants? This, this is wrong. You, that they're, it's not the right way to, to put regulation. It's only actually just changing the way in which we discriminate against people uh, with cannabis laws in another way. So it's, it's to legalize it, but we still have it illegal if you grow seven plants. You can only grow six. Well, it's good. It's good you can grow six because it's an improvement in growing none. But still, wh- why six? Where are they pulling this number from? What are they saying? If I grow seven plants, I'm a criminal? Why? Why is that? Why am I a criminal if I grow seven plants? What if I'm a patient who requires an abundant amount of, of raw cannabis and I require more than six plants? What the hell? Well, where is the government getting this number from? It's just another form of discrimination and, and, and to, to maintain some form of control over people, basically. That's the way I see it. Otherwise, why are they treating it like this? Why is it treated any differently to, to alcohol or tobacco? There's no limit to the amount of tobacco plants I can grow. There's no limit to the amount of uh, alcohol I can brew in my home. Well, there is, but it's absurdly high. And the same with the tobacco plants. Absolutely ridiculous. So I'll, I'll report back on this in time to come on what's to come there from uh, Mexico. Uh, hopefully I'll get uh, Pepe Rivera there back on again to, to fill us in on what's happening on the ground. Pepe Rivera is one of the activists there that's uh, part of the uh, Planton Cuatro Vente, which is the Planton 420 in uh, Mexico, where they have basically a cannabis garden set up right next to the Mexican Senate. And as uh, as Pepe Rivera told me there in that interview, they use their cannabis plants as a form of protest, and they also use their joints, their their whatever form of cannabis that they consume, they consume it openly in a, in a form of protest. And it's a protest I want to bring here to Ireland. It's one I've done before, and it's going to be done again here very, very soon, guys. Cannabis plants, joints, and lots of smoke, like uh, whatever form of cannabis you consume, guys, whether it be in tincture, whether it be in topical, whatever it is, guys, bring it. We're going to openly consume it. We've to normalize this because it's just a plant. The prohibition of cannabis is the most unnatural thing that we've done in a very, very long time. It needs to end. Jeez. Uh, so onwards we go, guys. So, um... In the U.S. there recently, there was a a 91-year, or, geez, sorry, there was a a cannabis prisoner who was uh, sentenced to 90 years in prison um, who was released. Um, So amazing news there, and uh, this is coming from the guys at uh, the Last Prisoner Project. Um, So I'm just going to whip up uh, the guys there, the Last Prisoner Project, and um, transition you on over. Um, just so you can see, uh, the guys, uh, this is the Last Prisoner Project's uh, website. Um, amazing stuff that these guys do. So they're, they're fighting to see that uh, there will be no more cannabis prisoners behind bars in the US. Uh, and they're doing monumental work that they've got a number of cannabis prisoners uh, released um, o- over the last couple of months. Um, they're sponsored there by uh, people like Stevie D'Angelo. And uh, yeah, it's her, yeah, her Stevie D'Angelo, um, pictured here. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they do absolutely amazing work. So here's the story of America's longest serving non-violent cannabis prisoner, uh, Richard Delisi, um, and he's to be released after 32 years behind bars and he has since been released. And uh, I'm just going to quickly play a video here for you from, um, from where is this coming from? CTV News. So, for the first time since 1980. 1980- one second now, and I'm just going to make sure that this audio is playing here for you. Yeah, excellent. One second. Now let's start this again. For the first time since 1988, Richard DeLisi is out of this prison and a free man. He's going to get to meet some of his grandkids for the first time and spend Christmas with them. My family right here. After decades behind bars, My Richard DeLisi finally gets to hold his family. It's really an amazing feeling. But um, I knew it was uh, a long time coming. In the late 80s, Richard was put away for selling marijuana. He had agreed to smuggle over 100 pounds of it from Colombia to Florida. And he didn't just get a slap on the wrist. Richard was handed a 90-year sentence. He was never a convicted violent criminal. And I can personally tell you that as a former prosecutor from Miami-Dade County, I never saw anything like this. It's truly unjust. He has been ripped apart from his family for the last 32 years. 
and society, Palm Beach County, we are no safer because of that. Richard says his time in the South Bay Correctional and Rehabilitation Facility was a real learning experience. It was a rough time, I'll tell you that. It was a rough ride. A ride he was ready to get off of, and he finally did thanks to the last prisoner project. It was absolutely time to do everything in our power um, towards his release. The group works with attorneys to get nonviolent criminals with cannabis charges released from jail and from prison. I feel really strongly that anybody who has been incarcerated or is currently incarcerated, that they're actually victims of unjust laws. But that's not what Richard is focused on today. He's focused on family and his freedom. I'm going to celebrate at the Rustic Inn and eat some crabs this afternoon. So today we celebrate Richard DeLisi's release. But tomorrow we have to go back to work because the reality is is that this state and this country is filled with thousands of Richard Delisi. Richard isn't positive where he's going to end up yet, but he knows he wants to spend the rest of his life with family. From South Bay, Madeline Montgomery, CBS 12 News. And there you go, guys. Um, fuck. That's like a very, like that's crazy. 32 years behind bars. Um do you know, I, I'm just going to go through the story here with you guys because, uh, and, and I'm going to try to keep my emotions together because, uh, geez, I can really empathize with, with this man and what it must have been like be, to be behind bars for so freaking long. Um, and I, I guess, like, he, he knew the risks he was taking when he undertook that journey all those years ago to to take the risk to import cannabis uh, into America from, uh, I can't remember, you know, it was a Columbia or somewhere that he was going to be tra trafficking it in from. But to spend that much time behind bars, like, so, um, the story as it goes here, while serving a 90-year prison sentence for selling marijuana, uh, Richard Delessi's wife died, as did his 23-year-old son, and both his parents. Imagine that. Behind bars, losing all of those family members, you know, robbed from, from the time with them because of his crime of cannabis, like, uh, absolutely, like, so inhumane to do that to anybody, like, that prohibition of cannabis, like, Jesus, what an evil, evil piece of policy, taught up by some evil, evil people, really, it really and truly is, cannabis is not a dangerous plant, it has harmed nobody, the most dangerous thing about it is the fact that it's fucking illegal and getting caught with it, because if you get caught with it, you spend 32 fucking years behind bears, people, that is wrong. That is wrong on so many bloody levels. Like, and oh man, I'm just trying to keep back the tears here because, like, oh man, I feel, really feel for for Richard here and, and what he must have been feeling. Like, uh, being told that, that at all those times, four four major losses in his life while he was behind bars. His adult daughter was in a horrific car accident and suffered a, par a paralyzing stroke as a result. He never met two granddaughters. A lifetime of missed memories. Yet 71-year-old Delessi walked out of a Florida prison on Tuesday morning, grateful and, and unresentful as he hugged uh, his tearful family. Jesus, man. After serving 31 years, he said uh, he's just eager to restore the lost time. Delessi was believed uh, to be the longest-serving non-violent cannabis prisoner according to the last prisoner project which championed uh, his release. Delissi also finally met his 11-year-old and 1-year-old granddaughters for the very first time this week. He says, I'm blessed as a human being, uh, I'm blessed as a human being a survivor, the Lissy said in a phone interview with the Associated Press on Wednesday while he was in the parking lot of his favourite hamburger joint as he watched his granddaughters laugh and bunks a ball. The simple things in life, you know, that you'll miss when you're fecking behind bars for, for cannabis like Jesus, man. The Lissy was sentenced to 90 years for cannabis trafficking in 1989 at the age of 40. Even though the typical sentence was only 12 to 17 years, he believed he was targeted with the lengthy sentence because the judge mistakenly thought he was part of an organised crime because he was an Italian from New York. The lessee said he had opportunities but never had any desire for that life. He prefers not to dwell on his on lost memories and time he'll never get back. He's not angry and instead takes every opportunity to express gratitude and hope. Prison changed me, he says. I never really knew who God was, and now I know, and it changed the, the way I talk to people and treat people. Um, said uh, Delessi, who has become a mentor to younger inmates. Um, for, for me, being there so long, I was able to take gang members from gangs to gentlemen. Uh, so, like, the prison service uh, kind of benefited, really, from having such such a person in there, you know. Um, they, they they basically you they well no they didn't use him he he used his time there to benefit the people he seen there but because the the prohibition of drugs basically it, it 
it's it, it unfortunately targets young men and, and it makes them targets of gangs who, who use them to, to you know, peddle their drugs and all of that stuff. So the prison service kind of really benefited from having uh, this guy here. Um, the article goes on to say then that uh, when the 40-year-old hipster uh, with the thick Italian accent first into prison, he was I- I- illiterate but taught himself how to read and write. Now he wants to make the best of every bit of, uh, of his time fighting for the release of other inmates through his organisation, com. The system needs to change and I'm going to try my best to be an activist, he says. Um, Kara Juster, a former uh, Florida prosecutor who handled the case pro bono for the last prisoner project, uh, criticised the lessee's lengthy sentence as a sick indictment of our nation. The family has spent over two quarter of a million on attorney fees or, or, and over 80,000 on long distance international collect calls over the past few decades. But it's not money that they want back. Rick DeLessie was only 11 years uh, old when he sat in the courtroom and said goodbye to his father. Now he's a successful business owner and a wife, uh, and with a wife and three children living in Amsterdam, he can't wait to bring his father overseas and to their vacation home in Hawaii. Jeez, he's living in Amsterdam. <laughs> you could follow it in the, the father's line of business, maybe. <laughs> um, th- those are memories uh, his father yearned to create while he was locked up. Taking a swim, lay in the sun, oh, so many things. Eat a Jack's hamburgers, uh, the father said. Every moment, even the little ones, are milestones. For for years, 43-year-old Rick uh, dreamed of cooking his father's breakfast uh, like they did, like he did Wednesday morning with heaping platters of eggs, baking sausages and biscuits. He burst into tears just watching his dad eat a bagel and drink a bottle of water. Jeez, man. And that didn't come from the, the prison commissary. <laughs> But it's bittersweet thinking about the last time they waste uh, for, for what he's on us. It's just kind of uh, like torment on your soul. For 31 years, uh, he said, I was kind of robbed of what my whole life... Um, I, I, I was kind of robbed of my whole life, so I just appreciate that I can witness it. But on the other hand, I feel like it wasn't uh, some... Uh, uh, oh, geez, I am watery eyes, hairs, and hard to read. <laughs> but on the other hand, I feel like it uh, isn't somebody responsible... Is there somebody that can answer to this? Rick DeLessie said that his family fell apart after his father's sentence. His mother never recovered. His brother overdosed and died. His sister was in a terrible car accident and Rick fled uh, at the, con- the country uh, Rick fled the country at 17 to get away from the pain. Uh, I can't believe they did this to my father. I can't believe they did this to my family. The grieving son said, describing the reunion like opening up an old painful wound. His voice cracks and his eyes well up with tears as he talks about how grateful he is to finally see his dad. There's a feeling of who's responsible for this debt in my mind and justice, uh, said Rick the lessee. I don't mean to, I don't mean debt with money. I mean something more valuable and that's time and that's something you can never get back. And there you have a picture of uh, of Richard the lessee, father of uh, Rick the lessee, his son who is talking there within that article as well. Um, Powerful stuff, like absolutely heartbreaking, you know. Um, uh, it you know it makes me wonder, you know. I get pissed off over spending five days in prison for my little bit of cannabis activism and uh, possession of cannabis. Jeez, man, I can't imagine what it would be like to spend all those years behind prison, uh, behind bars, and in, in prison. Um, while I'm prepared to go to prison for my beliefs here uh, and all of that, uh, I just. It's the most painful thing to go through, uh, and it's only, if I didn't have kids, it would be much easier. But the fact that the, what they're robbing me of is time with my kids, um, that, that's the most painful thing. I'll never forget those sunny days in, in the Cork prison in the yard, looking up at that sky, knowing that only a couple of hundred, me, hundred meters away, um, my family were uh, looking at that same sky without me. You know, my, my kids were growing up without me, and I know it was only a very short period of time, but... I I felt it and and they felt that absence because my kids see me every bloody day and I play a big role in their life and I imagine that this man probably played a big role in his kid's life Um, he had a son who went on an overdose who knows maybe if his father was present and playing more of a a role in his life he he might not have overdosed who knows his wife who who died there uh, because of the stress of an absent uh, husband uh, Maybe she might have been still around. She might have been able to fight off whatever sickness uh, took her. Um, who knows? Like, but really, it's it's very sad to be like it's it's good months to see him re- released, but it's so sad to just think of all those years lost, all of that time lost. 
time never to be replaced. Like, uh, this man was put there on art to, to live his life and he was denied that right because of uh, these cannabis laws. I mean, if they not forget this, this is a human rights issue. Like, uh, it really is. We have a right to live our life free and uh, not have to be bullied behind bars. Uh, and cannabis, there's no justification there for locking a person up for cannabis. So you're denying a person their, their basic human rights by locking them up for cannabis possession and uh, sale and supply, any of that stuff. You're locking them up. There's no justification there for it, guys. And we all need to fight this. We all need to fight it together. It's the only way we're going to do it. We need to force the hand of the government. They're not They're not going to just openly do this for us, you know. They're, they're really not. Uh, and... You know, until we, until we force the hand, you know, that that's that's the only time we're going to see it. Sorry, I just noticed the overlay there is in the wrong thing. There we go. It's at the front. <laughs> that was just bothering me there. The overlay down in the bottom corner was in the wrong spot. But anyhow, guys, I got a little distracted there on that. Um, but look, um. I'll move on because uh, my eyes have now cleared and uh, the emotions are settled. Other news there for you guys. Um, we go onwards. Uh, we go to Cape Town in South Africa where we had uh, a couple of hundred Rastafarians there taken to the street to protest again for their rights and their rights to, to, to access the cannabis uh, to the cannabis industry. They're, they're saying that they're being discriminated against by be not having proper access to take part in the uh, the cannabis industry down there and, and rightly so so it says here that uh, Cape Town around 300 Astafarians ma marched through the streets uh, over the exclusion of the indigenous people from the cannabis industry. They were also unhappy about the lack of legislation pertaining to the cannabis cultivation and the land distribution the march organised by the Black Farmers Association of South Africa was joined by the Delft uh, Chamber of Business, the Rastafari United Front and the Rastafari Ganja Council, Western Cape and 10 affiliated associations. The march commenced uh, at the Grand Parade on Thursday, then moved to the Parliament and then to the Western Cape Legislature and concluded at the Western Cape High Court. So quite a, a march that they went through there, hitting off of uh, key buildings within uh, the, the Cape uh, region. Um, the petitions were handed to the representatives from the office of the president, the premier and the judge president of the high court. Um, the Black Farmers Association um, of South Africa president, Dr. Lennox Exoil, um, said that uh, one of the demands made to the president was to revoke all cannabis licenses issued to the white owned pharmaceutical companies by the South African Healthcare Products Regulatory Authority. The cannabis plant is an indigenous plant that belongs to the indigenous people of the country. It is unfair that the SAFRA uh, gives these licenses to the so SAFRA, which is the South African Health uh, Products Regulatory Authority, sorry, um, give these licenses to the white companies. We also demand that all companies that are selling cannabis oil products such as Clix, um, Dischem and Canna Africa must remove all those products from their shelves because they are operating under the Illegal Acts of 1965. Delft Chamber of Business President uh, Harashad uh, Gel Ed Dunhees, um said that their participation was in solidarity. We believe that the economic growth starts within our townships and not in elite places in the Western Cape. We need to withdraw cannabis and all related products from the market that is, is, that is, as it is currently illegal. We want those culprits to be investigated, locked up and brought to book, he said. The groups have called for firm action against the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority and the removal of its current chairperson, Helen Rees, and to investigate blatant racism in the allocation of permits and licenses against the tenets of the constitution. Again, the constitution coming into play, guys, this is a reoccurring theme and it's something we need to get in uh, play here in Ireland we have a constitution it's there to protect us and we need to use it uh, they go on to say here that they said indigenous people have been deprived from this industry and have called for more inclusion through land allocation to indigenous peoples Rastafari United Front President uh, Tahu Tahu Haramamanaba sorry if I butchered your name man sorry um, said so Rastafarians were still one of the marginalised communities in South Africa. Again, as I say, guys, the prohibition of drugs around the world, it's a tool just to discriminate against certain segments of a population. And it's, it's here we go. It's another example of it, guys. It keeps on propping its head up. Like. 
The new cannabis bill that uh, Parliament is busy drafting is not speaking to us. Catering for the marginalised, there are no there are licences that are being issued according to the Apartheid Act of 1965, which is not BEE compliant. Um, no black person has cannabis licence. We are being jailed, beating up and are suffering because of cannabis. We're still on the periphery and we are protesting against this modern day discrimination and exploitation. The groups have requested for feedback within 14 days and of another pl- uh, march planned for January. And you know what, guys? I think well, I'm going to find out when that date is. And I think I'm going to have a march here in Cork City in solidarity with the guys in South Africa. Because we need to do this. This is a global issue, guys. This is not about cannabis at all. It's about our human bloody rights. And it's about the end of this discrimination. And it's the end of this stigma that exists here and only around cannabis and cannabis medicines. No other medicine gets discriminated against so much. No other plant bloody gets discriminated against so bloody much as cannabis does. So, yeah, I'm going to keep an eye out for that and uh, I'm going to have a march in solidarity with our brothers down there in South Africa. So, uh, shout out to the boys down in uh, South Africa. Guys, we're going to rep- we're gonna back you here in Cork and we're going to have a day of action in solidarity with you too. So do if any of you out there know anybody uh, participating in any of those groups that are affiliated with these marches, let them know. I'm going to do something here in Cork City, so uh, get up, send them my way. I'm going to r- try to reach out to them as well as best I can. But let's see what happens. And other news, guys, and it's kind of, it's in line with this, it ties into it, because, do you know, while, while we have people here in South Africa, the, the Rastafarians, the indigenous people there who are really fighting for access to it, do you know, we see in America, where, where big money, big money gets access to cannabis, you know, we've people, I, I reported on, on that man there, uh, on, um, geez, uh, forgetting his name already, Delissi, uh, R- R- Ricky uh, De- Delissi, uh, Richard Delissi, um, do you know, while he's only just getting freed from prison, do you know, we've people like Jay-Z, and, and he's making millions from, from cannabis. Uh, he's getting into a, a new company now called uh, Monogram. Absolutely ridiculous. While there's still people in prison for cannabis, we have people like Jay-Z now like, uh, getting in on it. And, and he's not alone in this. There's been countless other uh, cannabis, uh, or there's been countless other celebrities getting into this thing. You know, Snoop Dogg, um, you have uh, Cheech and Chong. Jeez, uh, the list goes on. Marta Stewart. Like, there's so many celebrities now cashing in on this. But meanwhile, we've got thousands and thousands of people in behind bars for the very same product that these guys are, are making so much bloody money on. And here we have Jay-Z with his Lucy's. You know, this is one product that he has. And, and his Lucy's, the, these are hand-rolled uh, joints um, that consist of uh, 0.4 grams of cannabis. And you can get them in packs of four. And uh, $40 for a pack of four, $10 uh, per 0.4 grams of uh, of thing, you know, and it's hand-rolled. All right, it's, it's a nice product, it's nice and everything, but it's just pure marketing. It's going to be Monogram, that's the name of his company. It doesn't have the name Jay-Z in there, but people are going to know, like, oh, that's Jay-Z's brand, uh, that's Monogram, because it's it's in the media, people are, like, trendy, they love this kind of crap. But meanwhile, like, well, what's going on? Like, well, why isn't it trendy to be supporting people like Richard Delessi and all those cannabis prisoners out there, you know? Well, why isn't Monogram, like, on the packaging of it, rather than it just being this bold, kind of, uh, bland monogram, very, kind of, uh, oh, sophisticated and, and uh, do you know, fancy? Why well, doesn't have it on there, like, uh, some, some form of awareness raising that there's prisoners in prison for cannabis still and we're not happy about this? You know, why aren't they doing this? Why are they just cashing in? Oh, it really pisses me off when you see people cashing in on this and, and they're just they're they're not doing anything to, to undo the, the prohibition around this, you know. Uh, and more of it, like here we go, uh, from the monogram as well. Uh, the monogram OG hand roll. Like very <laughs> cool name and all everything, like you know, the OG hand roll from monogram, like it's and it's fifty fucking dollars a pop for this thing. Um I, I don't know how much actual cannabis goes into this. Uh, probably just more than a gram maybe goes into it. But uh, it takes inspiration from the, the smoke experience of a premium cigar. So again, just more fancy words and all of that kind of crack, like uh for f- to sell you a bloody product, you know. Um but but it's, it's just really annoying, you know. It says here that the, oh yeah, this is a, a two gram, or, or no, sorry, retailing for $50. It was created by highly trained artisan rollers that break the flower down by hand and roll it using a time-honored process that was specially architect, architected by Monogram Culture and Cultivation Ambassador, DeAndre Watson. 
So like <laughs> you know, DeAndre Watson, whoever this guy is, I don't know who he is. It ma- ma- means nothing to me. But this guy hand rolled these uh, premium premium products. Um, but meanwhile, we still have prisoners that aren't seeing their family behind bars because they also try to sell cannabis. Scumbags out there, boys. Scumbags, and uh, needs to end. Uh, cannabis prohibition needs to end. It really fucking does. Like ah. Oh. So, guys, that is it for today. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in for uh, today's 420 News. Thank God I had some bit of positive news there uh, to begin the show with. Um, and other positive news there with cannabis prisoners being freed. Um, that is other positive news. But, again, vast majority of the news is fucking negative when it comes to cannabis. And sorry about the, the cursing. They keep it PG. <laughs> keep the expletives out. Um, so let's go on over and see what's happening out there, guys. Um, I see the first few comments there are admiring the new intro. So uh, thanks very much, guys. It's uh, it's great to see that you like it. <laughs> um, so Mick and Dave says, uh, love the intro and cool intro. Uh, Carol says, about that time now too. So I think Carol might have been sparking up out there. So <laughs> Francis says, hey, everyone. How's everyone Stay going. Glad to be tuned into today's 420 News. And uh, John says as well, well, hey, it's Martin's World Time. Good stuff, guys. Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining in today's show. Dave adds in that it's a step in the right direction. And he's referring there, I'd imagine, to the uh, to the start of this show when I was talking about the patients now getting the, the medicine delivery delivered. And uh, that is a, definitely a step in the right direction. But we have uh, we have a long way to go before we get to that finish line, Dave. And the battle, the, the, the fight continues. A quick hoorah, and we get back to it. <laughs> Francis says then that it's a, it's a step closer, just need to legalise it again. Yeah, prohibition needs to end. That's, that's the real uh, finish line. Um, Paul says they should still go to jail for denying Eva's medication. I agree with you, man. Simon, Stephen, all of those culprits, they should all be locked up because they prolonged the suffering of patients and uh, they, they did it with no justification. Like, there's no justification for it. I just don't understand it. It's, it's so fucking evil. Um, David adds in here, uh, David Shadlow, uh, he says, let's annoy him more. We need a new hashtag to flood his Twitter every day to legalize cannabis. I agree with you, man. Let's uh, let's think it up. Uh, end cannabis prohibition. Um, cannabis is medicine. You know, all those hashtags. Uh, we, ha- we have to come up with a good one. Um, I think uh, Talk to Vera one now has uh, served this purpose because uh, Vera has got her meeting. She's going to meet with him sometime later in the week. So we definitely need to come up with a, a good hashtag um, that we need to keep going and roll right into 2021 because uh, I think 2021 is the year we, we need to see cannabis decriminalized and the process for legalization set forth. So um, a good hashtag that we need to keep and use uniformly right across the, the country targeting Stephen Donnelly, Helen McEntee and Frank Fian. They're the three most important people we need to be targeting when it comes to our drug policy. Um, Cahill adds in here that uh, Ireland has no restrictions on poisonous, deadly and toxic plants. So I can grow wolfsbane or rice and highly poisonous plants, uh, but not cannabis. You're, you're dead right, man. I done a video there not too long ago where I just took a walk out the road and I found countless plants that had known deadly toxins in them. And there's no laws around these plants. I can pick them, I can bring them home, I can process them, I can make teas with them and serve them to people and kill them. Obviously, killing somebody, there's a law against doing that, but there's no law against possessing, as you said, um, the, the, the wolfsbane. There's no laws around that, despite the fact it's a deadly, known deadly plant. So, yeah, well done for bringing that one up, Kyle, man. Um, there's so much uh, uh, contradiction there out there when it comes to these uh, these laws around our drugs. Why is it that these deadly plants aren't banned, but the ones that people like to use? Because as we say, like yeah, drug use is a part of being human. Just be honest, for millenni- for as long as humans have existed, we've see- sought out altered states in numerous ways. So many ways. It's just a natural part of being human. And as I said earlier, the, the prohibition of drugs, prohibition of cannabis, it's the most unnatural, unhuman thing that we've ever done in, in the last uh, hundred years. And we need to undo it right now um paul adds in here that uh, the cannabis has no value until in a packet with a price and barcode in a supermarket or off license yeah and he says the same dipshit, dipshit prohibitionist running tax crime scam in england and most of the world and he says uh, also don't bother catching a murderer just uh, waste taxes chasing people who smoke pot 
Yeah, I agree with all those, man. Yeah, they, they will just go after the low-hanging fruit because it's easy to search a person for cannabis because uh, it's not too hard to tell who might or might not have cannabis on the street. So again, discrimination, they're profiling who they're stopping and searching to pick the low-hanging fruit in order to climb the career ladder because, as you said, it's much harder to catch a murderer. Why bother going chasing a murderer when the same amount of time you can catch 100 cannabis users? And Rebecca adds in here, pharma whores. I agree with you. Nice tag. <laughs> um, Paul adds in then, uh, being done for cannabis is as serious as being arrested for a packet of crisps. It's true, man. Like, what's next? Like, uh, these laws around cannabis prohibition. What, like, are they going to bring in laws around BMI? Are we going to make it illegal to be obese because that's not good for your health either? Who knows? And uh, Kyle, from a rat. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's always the rats, man, who are snitching and... Uh, leading to these police raids. And um, John O'Regan says that uh, as regards to the Mexican deadline, they don't realise that every day they delay is another day innocent Mexican people are persecuted. And, and you know, it's true, and they, they should be held to account for this, and uh, it's wrong that they're allowed to do it. Especially with the ruling of the Supreme Court, you, you would think there, there would be penalties or something there for it but unfortunately not they're allowed to discriminate against these people as much as they want david adds in here that uh, we should plant a load of hemp all around ireland and get the message out there man feed birds that's the campaign we we need to launch i'll be doing it anyway this year and um, for sure lots of cannabis plants and lots of days of action around cork city and ireland um Carl adds in hemp seed is cheap uh, two to three euro a kg it is is very cheap guys we could be growing lots and lots of hemp for very little price uh, for very little money um lucas adds in we should also send a joint to each td just like luke ming did uh, back in the day they got the news on board only if we had more tds like him rather than send a joint to the td guys bring that joint that you would have sent to the td and smoke it outside of their office go down to their office and have a smoke outside of their office we, that's what we should be doing. Like, we should be having 420 smoke ups outside of all of their bloody offices or something, you know. Just show up, just civil disobedience. Show them that we're all here. You can't criminalize and lock us all up because you don't have enough room in your prisons. Uh, and your court systems are backlogged because of it. It's a joke. Uh, yeah, make it like nettles, uh, as Carl said here. Like, yeah, nettles, great bloody plant, same as cannabis, uh, full of very good nutrients. And uh, that's what we should regulate cannabis. <laughs> David Shadlaw, uh, he says, I know it can't be smoked, but imagine if I st if it started popping up in parks and loads of random places. Yeah, while well, it can't be smoked, you know, it still has some benefits. People could go out there, collect the hemp and make CBD tea, make hemp tea. There's certainly still benefits out there uh, outside of smoking it. Um, making tea, as I said, is one. Juicing is another. Um, Kaha lads in eventually ending up uh, in roofing and gutters in the north side. Some hope of keeping it illegal then. Yeah. <laughs> Feed the birds, boys. Spread the seed everywhere, you know. <laughs> uh, John O'Regan adds in, as regards discrimination against Rastas, I was reading a job application from for a uh, farm for working as a trimmer in California. You can't have any convictions for drugs. I didn't know that, John. Nice one for adding in. And uh, Monshore Fudge adds in here, says, uh, do one for Jay-Z. I'm an artist and roller and I've been 20 odd years. I'll crush down and rap myself for free. I'll do a Pepsi challenge with you. <laughs> Excellent show, man. Don't know where you find the info, but brilliant. And yes, amazing intro. Nice one, Monshore, man. And uh, we'll have to check out that uh, those uh, hand rolling skills of yours sometime, man. Uh, do let me know when you're in Cork City and uh, we link up for a, a cup on tea. Uh, <laughs> last few comments then there. Uh, John O'Regan says, uh, if the public uh, found out that there was a people or, or there was a group of people who have delayed medical advance is for over fifty years, what would they do? Well, uh, who knows? That's uh, maybe that's why they're resisting this uh, because they don't want to admit that they've been lying to the public for so long. Who knows? And uh, Monsieur Fudge uh, hashtag THC for free. And Tina McLeod then adds in her finally that uh, if the seeds come from monogram, it, monogram, it's probably fake cannabis. <laughs> um, so, guys, thanks very much for everybody's participation in the show today. It's been absolutely amazing to, to bring the, the 420 news to you. Um, and again, thanks very much to the Deegan Media um, for uh, assisting there with the capturing of my lovely backdrop, which you see behind me, and the lovely intro as well that uh, I had at, at the start. And uh, that bong rip actually was mine. So <laughs> if you happen to hear that sound coming through there in the, the intro, that bong rip was recorded earlier today. 
um, by Martin's world. <laughs> and some cannabis was burnt in the process. So, guys, um, again, uh, if you want to support the show, if you want to support uh, fight for cannabis legalization in Ireland, uh, don't forget to sign up to patreon.com forward slash Martin's world or make a donation in Bitcoin up there in the uh, right hand corner of the screen or left hand, whatever side there, where I'm pointing to, uh, martinsworld.ie, and uh, you'll find a link there to make donations in Bitcoins. So, guys, thanks very much. Uh, it's been uh, a pleasure. Until next time, guys, stay blazed out there. Keep her lit. Peace. <laughs>